Hi, everyone. This is Paige Arthur, just welcoming all of you to the panel on a friend or foe, emerging technologies and conflict early warning in the age of compound risk. Let's just wait another 30 seconds or so um, as people join, and then we'll get started. So just 30 seconds and I'll be back. Great, I think we can get started now. Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Paige Arthur. I'm the Deputy Director at the Center on International Cooperation at NYU. I'm very happy to be here virtually at the Stockholm Forum. Of course, it's always better to, to be in person and, um, and we certainly miss it this year, but really grateful for the chance to connect with you and to put together this, this panel, um, which we're calling Friend or Foe. Um, and it is about emerging technologies and conflict early warning in this age of compound risk, which is of course what we're, what we're talking about at the Stockholm Forum this year. Um, so let's first acknowledge that the risks are great and that they are transforming. And the emphasis on early warning is as relevant now as it has ever been. Um, but as the COVID crisis has shown us, and as this forum has, has stressed, risks are multidimensional and they create cascading effects. So what started out as a health crisis has created economic and social crises, which can then cascade into political and peace building crises. And we shouldn't underestimate the gravity of the situation. Um, as Susan Cutter has observed, cascades occur as a consequence of the loss of capacity in one system, overwhelming a connected system, elevating the impacts from hazard to disaster, to catastrophe. So where do emerging data-driven technologies fit into this highly dynamic landscape? It's important to note that data-driven approaches are not new. Efforts to gather data in order to better understand where conflicts might arise go back decades, if not farther. But there is something new in this moment. And first, there's a qualitative change in the data available in terms of scale of the data, velocity of the data, and availability of data. And second, there's been a quantum leap in methods. And this includes new methods to detect patterns within large volumes of data, often through using machine learning techniques, as well as advances in data science relating to predictive modeling, as well as other advances. In spite of these advances, though, I would suggest we're really still in the beginning stages of a process to really decipher which data is meaningful and when. So the goal of this short session is to give you a sense of the creative opportunities that exist for deepening the use of data-driven approaches, not just to address risks, but also to generate practical solutions to real problems that people working on peace building and violence prevention may face. And indeed, these data-driven technologies, such as machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, and so forth, are incredible tools that open vast new horizons for peacebuilding actors. But the problem we found is that peacebuilding actors often just don't know how to harness them. And they would benefit not just from better capacity, but a stronger connection to people with a different set of skills. So our panelists are at the forefront of a new direction in the field. One uses state-of-the-art predictive modeling and a wide variety of data sets to assess emerging risks. Another combines remote sensing in conflict settings with artificial intelligence to warn of impending harms. And another analyzes the interaction between climate and political risk. So we hope that through highlighting their work, we can spark some further creative ideas for collaboration. My organization, the Center on International Cooperation, 
has been working for the past year to build a community of practice around data for peace building and prevention. And I'm happy that Branka Panich, who's been our partner on that, is here to talk about that as well today. So we're bringing together a wide range of actors from academia, non-governmental organizations, governments, multilaterals, the private sector, all through convenings like this one. And I want to say thank you to the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who's been supporting this initiative. So if this event speaks to you, I'm also going to invite you to an upcoming virtual workshop we have on early warning, early action, um, which is coming up later that this month. Um, but more on that later. Let's turn to our panel now. And I'm very happy to welcome first Chris Mahoney, who is the CEO and co-founder of Peloria. So Chris, you have developed this idea for Peloria over the past few years. Where did the idea come from and what makes Peloria's approach distinctive when it comes to early assessment of risk? Over to you. Thank you, Paige. Thanks, uh, Branka. Thank you to uh, NYU, to the Center on International Cooperation, to your supporters, the uh, Dutch Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs, uh, of course, to, to, to Cipri and the, uh, and the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their uh, support of this, important, uh, of this important conference and the opportunity to share uh, what we're doing, but more importantly, to learn from uh, also from our co-panelists and yourselves, uh, and hopefully uh, some, some critique from the, from the audience as to how we go about what we do. Um, what we do came about um, as a consequence of uh, the Pathways for Peace process, which was uh, a joint report between the United Nations and the World Bank the first time they published uh, published anything jointly really on international peace and security. And um, part of uh, my portfolio as part of the uh, team working on that report was to identify knowledge gaps that we have uh, in identifying factors that uh, um, exaggerate or, or mitigate risk of violent conflict. And so uh, I was bringing a number of actors to New York to present their, their approaches and uh, one of those actors uh, had spent um, sort of half a decade focusing on um, the leveraging of large language data sets. Uh, he's had special access um, with uh, Recorded Future and was, but was at the same time an anthropologist. So um, was not necessarily a, a data scientist, but was able uh, to come to this sphere from, uh, through a multidisciplinary lens, which was very endearing to us. And we uh, then went about uh, exploring a hypothesis that, um, that we jointly developed, which is that by integrating uh, multidisciplinary social science expertise into data selection, data curation, data modeling, we would then be in a position to dramatically enhance the uh, predictive uh, accuracy, uh, geographic specificity, uh, look ahead periods of uh, um, of early warning capability when it comes to social phenomena. And uh, so we did that, we achieved 85% uh, accuracy uh, over a sort of a 100 to 120 day look ahead period in, um, in a model that we developed. And then uh, when touring that model to different ministries of foreign affairs, uh, um, OECD and um, here in Washington DC to uh, colleagues at uh, State Department and then at, uh, colleagues over at the Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is where they referred us to uh, someone they believed was doing uh, cutting edge work at the United States Institute of Peace. That was their chief data scientist, Professor Rahini Shrahari. And um, we went and shared uh, our approach with her. And that became, began a conversation that uh, led to uh, Rohini joining us in, uh, in co-founding uh, Peloria. Uh, so that's where Peloria came from. She is a data scientist. My background is in law and political economy, and uh, and we have a um, uh, an anthropologist also as our as our co-founder. We're now bringing on one of the uh, co-authors of the um, IPCC's Africa chapter. He's uh, as our lead on what we call natural world phenomena, uh, and we have uh, a number of uh, research associates and uh, data scientists and software engineers. Uh, now delivering uh, models uh, across different continents. Um, then what I'll do perhaps is just uh, very quickly take, uh, give you an example, uh, perhaps of, of, of what we do uh, if 
I'm able to share my screen here if uh, I could trouble the, uh, the moderator to enable that. Um, I'll quickly tour you through one of our, one of our models um, that uh, where we in effect use data representing real phenomena and what we call the natural. So that's all your environmental, uh, environmental data, everything from um, temperature, rainfall, soil moisture to um, satellite generated imagery data, which uh, will tell you a lot about uh, the um, uh, greenness or not uh, of uh, shrubbery, um, but also tells you about what we call built world data, which is the number, size, nature of, um, of uh, structures, of uh, transport infrastructure, um, and then um, social world data. So that's everything from uh, demography to, uh, to uh, human events, whether they be political, whether they be violence events themselves, whether, and then of course, uh, the uh, economic data, everything from macrophysical indicators uh, to business to business data to commodity prices and, uh, and, um, and, and those phenomena. So um, that is how uh, we're able to first develop a picture of what's happening in reality, right? But then, of course, it's not just reality that drives human behavior. So we also draw on data that uh, indicates uh, perception of that reality. So accompanying the data representing change in the natural, social, and built world, we also collect data representing language sentiment about the phenomena in the natural, built, and social world from online language news, from uh, social uh, media. Uh, now we're also able to do this uh, from audio where we transcribe that audio to text and we also gather the data representing the tone of the enunciation of that, of that audio. So here, for example, is a model we commonly uh, tour de um, develop, um, developed for a, um, uh, a development actor where say, for example, um, on August 16th um, we, of, of, of last year, we predict and then um, in, uh, in advance of the questions around the ethics of what we do, I've taken us uh, right back so that I'm not providing to the audience the, the current predictions of, of change in levels of violence. But here we predict three different forms of violence across four territories, all of Kenya, the Rift Valley region, the coastal region and the capital region. So I can change this to write some protests. You'll see the optimal look ahead period, which is what it will automatically go to is 120 days. We have an accuracy of 98%. Um, it will tell you how many events we would predict in that 120 days, uh, the number of events that occurred in the uh, preceding same number of days. Um, I can change this to 75 days if uh, that is the period of time in which this development actor wishes to roll out uh, a, um, a development project um, or uh, for some other reason that's their interest and it will change, it will give you that level of accuracy and the number of events uh, forecast over that. Uh, number of days I can change it to the capital region of Kenya and again the, it will give you the level of accuracy the number of events the number of events in the preceding same number of days and then uh, you can it's accountable so you can change the date uh, and you can see uh, to what extent we got it right or to what extent we got it wrong either uh, by coming to the analytics page uh, and it will break down for you uh, the number of events uh, of the different types of violence events in uh, the different territories uh, broken down to the day. And you can scroll in and out temporally to see week to week. Uh, and then you can come and see, for example, change in language sentiment, both positive sentiment, negative sentiment, and the volume of language sentiment about all these different uh, topics that are commonly associated with change in levels of violence in Kenya, for example, right? So, this gives a client a broad overview. We can weave in and visualizations uh, key events, whether they be religious, whether they be uh, the selection of political candidates, political parties, actual elections themselves, um, uh, sporting events as well. For example, we're developing a model for Chennai and we find that sentiment, for example, there may change dramatically based on whether the Chennai Super Kings cricket team wins or loses, right? And negative or positive sentiment about availability of uh, water, uh, about uh, air quality. Um, uh, those things haven't changed in reality, but negative sentiment uh, after a Chennai Super Kings cricket loss, team loss has gone, uh, has increased significantly. So we can 
uh, see those things. We can also see under what ch changes in configuration of reality, those, uh, um, those factors increase or decrease. And what most importantly that means for uh, this kind of early warning approach is that it's not just that we're predicting. What's even more important is that we're engaged in explainable AI, right? So we can identify uh, the factors, the configuration of factors in reality and perceptions of them most associated with change in levels of violence. And this just gives you an insight into just one of those, right? Where I can select in descending order, uh, um, I can identify, have the uh, machine learning algorithm identify the tweets whose sentiment is most associated with increase or decrease in, in violence. Right? And of course we can do this across the different uh, sources of online language data, whether it's online news, uh, other social media sources. Um, but I can look for just negative sentiment um, and just negative sentiment by a number of influential actors right, in Kenya across, the, um, uh, across business leadership, social leadership, uh, including religious leadership, uh, um, political leadership, you'll have all your uh, politicians in there. And I could select just a number of uh, neg only negative sentiment uh, by all actors. I left it on all, yep, uh, uh, um, just about those topics. And I click submit and it will rank from top to the very, you know, three or four millionth tweet um, uh, whose language sentiment, whose negative language sentiment about those topics is associated with change in violence. Then we can go do an even deeper dive to see under what configurations of change in temperature, rainfall, uh, uh, the price of fuel, the price of uh, uh, maize or rice, uh, all, all these other uh, configurations of change in reality, these, uh, this language sentiment has an even greater uh, or smaller uh, relationship to, to change and whatever the dependent variable is, right? It's just not just not just violence, but we also uh, forecast uh, social unrest related disruption of uh, road and rail, social unrest, uh, um, also change in levels of poverty. Um, and that's really what enables us to advance our mission, which is to bring government, civil society and the private sector together around inclusive just, uh, I'm sorry, around evidence-based approaches to inclusive, just and resilient societies. Um, so well, that's great, Chris. I think that's a wonderful overview of this. And I, for me, I think what's um, what's really fantastic is it shows a kind of a really creative approach that <laughs> that emerged out of this bureaucratic, you know, process, which was the Pathways for Peace report and that collaboration between between the bank and the UN and the learning that happened from that. Um, and then people going off creatively and putting together partnerships to kind of develop a new a new reality. But the different kind of data sets that you employ, you know, social, economic, environmental, along with perception data, I think is really innovative. Um, so thanks very much. And we're going to come back in the discussion questions as well. But let's um, let's move on next to Dan Hanaberry, who's the director of analytics for Halla Systems. Um, and Dan, Hala Systems has been a recognized leader in the use of remote sensing uh, for civilian protection in some of the most difficult contexts in the world. And of course, I think many people know about your work in, in Syria, which has been much covered in the news. But tell us more about Hala Systems Works and about some of your most important projects right now. Of course. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Arthur. Um, so, uh, as, as you say, I'm Hollis Director of Analytics. Um, I'm a data scientist by training, and before that, I um, worked in government and uh, in the private sector for a number of years. Um, the, um, the, the broad offering uh, of, um, of HALA is uh, this system called Sentry. Um, I say a system, it's really a, a system of systems. Um, its purpose is uh, broadly to, to gather efficient, to efficiently gather data uh, from uh, a number of sources. Uh, and then find ways to either put that into the hands of, uh, of civilians who can then, you know, uh, take, take action to, you know, save their own lives and to you know, live more productive lives or to support organizations that themselves are working uh, in the interest of improving civilian well-being. Um, so as, as you say, the, um, the primary um, sort of flagship deployment of, uh, of Sentry uh, is, the, uh, the, is the early warning system in Syria. So of course we, for those not familiar, we support uh, the Syrian civil defense. Uh, we run an airstrike early warning system in Northwest Syria, uh, observers on the ground, 
uh, combined with some other data sources, um, track the movement of aircraft, and um, then push, the, push that information forward uh, to civilians through one of a number of warning channels. Um, that started off with just social media on your phone, but fairly quickly uh, snowballed into um, other warning channels, including uh, being read over the radio um, to uh, air raid sirens that are uh, connected and can be remotely turned on. Um, and then even uh, most recently uh, to, to warning lights that uh, we've worked with schools and hospitals in Northwest Syria to install, which give just a, kind of a running uh, situational awareness um, of the skies around uh, the, the facility at any given time. Um, our, our challenges going forward, like our, our next projects that, um, that you ask about, um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's life as a startup. It, it's difficult for me to, to speak with, um, you know, a, a authority about, you know, what we will necessarily be doing next year. Um, certainly the ones that are, <laughs> that seem to have the most um, promise right now are the ones I can talk the least about. Um, but what I will say is that uh, our primary concern uh, as, we, as we want to move um, outside of Syria and begin to work in some other uh, contexts is that we need to broaden the scope of this system. Um, you know, certainly uh, it is you know, very useful to have information on aircraft moving around, um, but in order to be truly useful in general purpose, our challenge has been to find ways that this can be used to conflict uh, generally. Um, Certainly no one is attempting to be subtle when they're flying around a war zone in a you know, multi-ton screaming war machine. So you know, we're working to uh, implement additional data sources. Um, depending on context, um, the observer network that we rely heavily on may not be able to have as live a connection with us as possible. So we're working to find ways to empower observers who are far away from uh, you know, the, the internet that uh, we all kind of take for granted. Um, we're working on ways to, uh, to implement more remote sensing technologies that can be uh, more rapidly rolled out in areas um, where infrastructure is limited. So satellite imagery, uh, but also very inexpensive sensors. Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, uh, you know, we're, we're branching out looking to find um, organizations that are working, uh, already working, uh, sometimes even with observer networks already. Uh, to find out how we can integrate ourselves into what they're doing and then become basically a technology partner to enhance and amplify uh, the work that they're already doing. Um, to give um, sort of a very tentative example um, that actually was on a call I just came from, um, we're, we're looking at a pilot project in Darfur. Um, and here, this pilot project um, would be looking at uh, sev uh, several specific sensitive sites um, that are important to um, refugees. Uh, and finding ways to offer um, warnings to them. Um, and this is in one way very similar to work we've already done, but of course it's, uh, it, it will require some of the uh, sort of evolution that uh, I spoke to uh, a bit earlier. Um, and so uh, I, I think um, that's it. I had a whole bunch of other notes on you know, how, the, how the system has been working and been being perceived, but uh, I think that's a good amount of time. So I'll, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Great, I'm sure we'll come to some of that in the discussion. Um, and also just want to invite people to um, start putting questions into the Q&A box. That's available and we will have time for discussion with, with these folks. But I, you know, I think Dan, you know, what's so, um, I think what you say really demonstrates the complexity of what you're trying to achieve, combining different data sources, um, you know, from, the remote sensing to satellite imagery, but of course there's always the human element and observer networks. Um, and so I think it's really important to keep that, the kind of ground level data that's that's really important, keep that in mind in these discussions. Um, so with that, I would like to turn to Adriana Abdunor, who's the executive director of Plataforma SIPO. And Adriana, you are an incredibly eloquent voice in global advocacy around climate and political risk. How has Plataforma SIPO played such a key role and what are you working on now? Uh, thank you very much, Paige. Thank you, Branca. Uh, it's lovely to be back in touch um, and uh, to be a part of this conversation. We at SIPO believe it's very important to include more Global South voices in the debates and also the innovations about uh, data and emerging technologies. So I'm very happy to be here with you. 
So I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing and um, what we're focusing on in the, in the uh, data area right now. Uh, CIPA is an independent, it's women-led institute based here in Brazil, dedicated to the intersection of climate governance and peace. And we have right now staff based in three different biomes around Brazil, uh, the Amazon, the Cerrado, which is the savanna part, and the Atlantic forest. And as part of our work, we analyze climate risks, especially in the Amazon basin, but we also look very closely at environmental degradation due to environmental crimes, such as illegal land invasions, um, forest fires, illegal logging and illegal gold mining. And um, of course there are patterns of uh, other types of crime and of violence and conflict even that are associated with the predatory use of natural resources. So we work very much at that intersection between uh, environmental crime and violence. And um, in one of our major projects right now, we support the public ministry here in Brazil to improve its investigative methods to curb uh, environmental crimes. Um, and this includes, by the way, one topic that's very dear to our hearts, uh, which is the attacks and assassination of environmental defenders in the Amazon basin, uh, not just the Brazilian Amazon, but Amazon wide. And the public ministry here in Brazil, it works very closely with civil society and in some instances with the private sector to identify environmental degradation hotspots and of course to prosecute those responsible, but also to develop um, extrajudicial uh, solutions uh, in the, the positive way. And what happens is that there is a major glut of data because primarily because of the availability of satellite imagery, which has uh, improved by leaps and bounds and associated georeference data. But at the same time, there are major gaps especially when it comes to capacity to filter, to process and to analyze and to cross reference with other data sources as well as qualitative analysis. So that's where Plataforma CIPO comes in um, since uh, many of us have either a data background or um, a qualitative research background. We issue, uh, we carry out analyses of different data, emerging data sources and technologies and issue recommendations as to how these can be better incorporated, for example, by the public ministry in addressing uh, the ecological crisis here in Brazil. And so we're very much interested in, in tracking um, changes in land use, uh, including environmental degradation, but also infrastructure construction, which is undergoing um, a major boom here in the region, especially with the entrance of um, uh, Chinese projects. And I'll give you two, very briefly, two examples of uh, emerging technologies <coughs> that we track and disseminate and two emerging data sources. So the first one is the use of satellite imagery and associated algorithms to detect and even predict changing land use. And this includes, for instance, illegal deforestation and gold mining in the Amazon. Um, there is a methodology that was developed by a Sao Paulo NGO called Mac Biomas. And this methodology serves primarily for tracking, but as I said, there is some predictive capacity that's being explored uh, through collaboration with other organizations, since the patterns and the rates of deforestation that we see in the Amazon basin are, um, um, they vary according to the cause. And of course, they are typically in indicative of an imminent uptick in environmental degradation, but also in violence. So it's very possible to, to, to carry out this analysis in a very fine grained uh, way. And for instance, by feeding now algorithms, um, by feeding the algorithms more data on artisanal gold mining or illegal gold digging as we're now calling it, uh, we see that the footprints of that particular type of activity is actually, it looks very different in the pixelation than um, uh, industrial mining, although of course there are also environmental crimes associated with industrial mining. And these are activities that literally open up space 
for all types of criminal actions and for violence. The second example, uh, Branka and, and Paige have already heard a little bit about this, is the use of audio connect connection. So this is also uh, done in association with artificial intelligence in order to detect illegal activities in the rainforest areas. And in some instances, it entails the distribution of cell phones and um, devices to detect, for instance, the noise of um, chainsaws in the forest or explosive material that's associated with types of uh, illegal gold mining. And the data is uh, automatically uploaded to the cloud for AI-based analysis. And so this, um, this, this is being <clears throat> used at an experimental level, but you know, there is um, there is a bit of potential, especially once the pandemic is over, because of course now the Amazon has been incredibly heavily affected by the pandemic. And so access to these, you know, this type of capillary access is very difficult to obtain right now. In terms of emerging sources, just to mention two very briefly first, um, we're now following very closely planned infrastructure projects based on documents that we obtained through um, access laws. So you know, from the federal government. And we're looking, for instance, at a Chinese railway that's set to cross most of the Cerrado and the Amazon region, and that crosses through areas of high illegal deforestation where there's already a lot of propensity for conflict and violence. And the second and last point uh, is that we're now following the money trail and looking at illegal financial flows that come out of environmental crimes and thus serve as an incentive for these activities and working with different international actors to track money and gold laundering so that we also obtain data and track it backwards to try to detect um, where this is coming from. So these are just some of the examples of the kind of work that we're doing right now, especially in the Amazon. Thank you. No, thank you to, uh, to you, Adriana, for sharing those. I actually I am amazed at the range of the work that you're doing and the different kinds of um, data methods that you're you're using and combining different data sources. I think you would have a lot to talk about with Dan actually at Hala Systems and some of your projects, as well as as well as with Chris. So I'm really glad that we were able to connect all of you on this panel. I'd like to end. Um, these kind of presentations with Branka Panich, who's our visiting fellow at CIC, but who's also the founder and executive director of, of AI for Peace. Um, and, you know, Branka, you um, last fall, we were very pleased to have been working you over, the, over this past year. And last fall, you developed a, um, a mapping of the ecosystem of organizations and people working on, on data driven approaches to peace and prevention. I wonder if you can highlight some of the most important risks that that we found in that from that particular report. Thank you, Paige, and it's such a pleasure to be uh, here and to talk about this work uh, that I've done. We actually started this, doing this work in the midst of pandemic, which I think it's really interesting to showcase this mapping uh, happening in the midst of uh, one of the prime examples of compound risks. So we actually were able to add a couple of questions when we were doing research to see how organizations are also uh, uh, tackling some of the challenges in their work coming from the pandemic itself. Um, so um, this uh, work uh, started almost a year ago and then uh, uh, the part of this work was finalized uh, uh, in October when we published uh, a report uh, by NYU CIC that mapped different organizations and projects that are mobilizing data and utilizing data-driven approaches to strengthen peace building and, and conflict prevention work. And I interviewed over 30 of these organizations and, and experts. And our, our idea was to shed light to some of the examples and potential positive impacts of these uh, technologies. And we are uh, super lucky, as Paige said, to, ha to have our, our guests today actually talking firsthand about some of these uh, cutting edge uh, examples. But another central topic of, of these conversations and, and these interviews was around not only opportunities, but also 
risks. And this is maybe this another dimension to conversation that I want to, to bring. So we heard how uh, organizations and our guests are looking into risks to, to forecasting conflict or, or violence or environmental degradation. But there is another level of risk coming into, the, into this uh, work when we are uh, applying new data-driven uh, approaches uh, of different ethical uh, constraints. And this is where this topic relates to friend or foe. So we really need, we believe that we really need to ask this question uh, uh, over and over again. And so often in these conversations that, that we had through this work, we saw a sort of a paradox in applying uh, uh, some of these approaches uh, in, in peace building and prevention, probably because of this specific context that we as peace builders are, are working in. So I'll explain in a couple of uh, uh, points how, what is this paradox about? So one of the general comments of, of peace builders was this challenge of data, and we already heard our uh, guests talking about this. So this can come as a challenge of lack of data, or this can come as a challenge of lack of quality of data. So in, in a majority of, of conversations that we had, and then especially in, not only in Global South, as Andriana pointed out, but in Global North as well, we often uh, depend on uh, data coming from nat uh, national statistics offices, uh, these open databases or international agencies. Uh, so Chris worked for the World Bank. Usually this is this data uh, uh, being used. However, in many cases, uh, this sources are simply not available. For many countries, they're not available uh, or they're not available in a, in a good quality. So uh, what, what we see is this potential of utilizing new technologies, including access to mobile phones, computers, uh, internet, uh, to maybe uh, somehow fill this gap. Uh, and Paige mentioned in the, in, in the introduction this uh, change in scale of velocity and availability. I think we are actually facing uh, a change in what we actually perceive as data at all. So not, data is not only number anymore. And we see our guests, how they are exploring this. So even exploring image, even exploring uh, uh, voice and text and even sound to, to try to fill this gap of, of information that, that we are not uh, having. Uh, what, what we also saw is this specific of uh, conflict or post-conflict or uh, violence settings. So this is another challenge to the work where people usually, uh, because of the security reasons, don't have a net physical access to these spaces. So this can be a potential, uh, at the same time, a, a risk to populations who are there, who can maybe serve as those who are providing uh, those data, but also potential. So this is where the technology can come as a friend, uh, offering these alternative uh, uh, resources. I want to bring back uh, into uh, uh, discussion this point of uh, observer network that, that Daniel mentioned. We really looked into this, trying to see uh, how populations that provide information are impacted. Are there any additional uh, risks? And, and we often saw this coming into conversation, you know, about the security and safety uh, risks that are out there that we, although we see, of course, the benefits and, and potentials of advancing our work and, and seeing, uh, getting uh, signals of early warning, uh, there is still this need to try to protect uh, populations that are anyhow vulnerable and, and in danger. Uh, we often hear this, and I, I think this is not something uh, that is specific for our field, it's across all fields and sectors where we are applying new data, lack of protection of personal information, uh, even location of end users, uh, of, of people who are data and communities who are data providers, collaborators. Uh, so what is different maybe in our sector is that this is not only a violation of digital rights, this is also a direct attack on their physical uh, security and safety. Uh, I will just quickly quickly mention a couple of more points that quite often uh, and, and wrap up uh, that quite often uh, those risks are coming as um, uh, unintended. Uh, 
uh, but we do see a lot of uh, cases when uh, there is a data weaponization. So intentional use of this information to target facilities or members of a specific vulnerable uh, group. I will finish with a quote that is my favorite one that is in this report that I actually took from Robert Kickpatrick, uh, the, the director of Global Pulse, uh, who is saying that we, and this is another paradox that is coming to the place, that we in our community, while, while using data-driven approaches to peace and security, we really need to balance the risk of misuse against the risk of misuse of data. So we really need this. We need this tool. We need to fill the gaps. We need to uh, uh, empower our work through new technologies and these approaches, uh, uh, but we at the same time need to be aware of, of risks. Uh, so I'll stop here and happy to come back to uh, discuss in details other points and also looking forward to hear what our guests, uh, how our guests are dealing with these topics in their own work. Thank you, Paige. Thank you so much, Branka. And can you do me a favor and put a link to the, the mapping report in the chat so that people can access it if they want? And I'd like to, so I see we're starting to get questions uh, in the question box. And so I'm going to gather those together. And some of them are already touching on the issues of some of the risks that Branka just mentioned. So I'd like to just talk with the panel briefly about some of the risks that they see. Uh, maybe even addressing some of these questions. So there are risks around, um, around mainly around data bias, um, around ethics that Branka raised. Um, but whereas Branka has kind of did a very great good job of laying out the various risks, maybe I can ask our speakers to talk about how they address them and deal with them in a in a positive way. So let me start with Chris and come to you about some of the risks that you've seen in your approach. And I see we've already gotten some questions in the chat about that and how you've addressed those. Um, thanks, Paige. I was just uh, trying to respond to a, to a number of those questions, which, uh, which, which were very um, well-directed uh, and, and very welcome. Um, we obviously uh, realize that there is enormous capacity for significant harm. Uh, accompanying the, the, the technical competency that we're developing. Um, and the even more concerning thing is that uh, regulatory uh, frameworks are not keeping up with the change uh, in, this uh, in this technical capacity. And so um, therein lies uh, a dearth or a void um, that we ourselves need uh, as, as a small startup, right? Need to expend our own uh, time and resources uh, to, to create those constraints. So we, um, one, have an internal process of identification of the risk associating what we can do, um, identifying the optimal methods to constrain uh, that risk in terms of uh, mitigating the risk or managing the risk. And then we identify the level of risk that we can't manage and mitigate away and weigh that risk against the risk of not providing uh, our capacity to, um, to be able to in, um, enable uh, a positive contribution um, to society. So we really constrain what we provide and what we don't provide agnostic to who we provide it to because we don't have the capacity to make uh, a determination about, oh, government X or government Y, you know, uh, uh, that these people are okay to engage with and these people are not. Uh, we're, we're never going to be able to, to make that judgment. And so we really in, instead have to constrain uh, what we do or what we don't do, depending on who the private sector, government or civil society uh, actor is. We don't, we don't take that approach. Instead, we are agnostic and they will filter themselves out if they're not comfortable with the constraints uh, that, that we impose on what we, on what we do and don't. Then we also have an ethics rights and governance uh, oversight board uh, that we're setting up. We're very fortunate to have uh, some global pioneers uh, across, um, across disciplines and experience assisting us with that, including uh, Lord Robin Butler, uh, Prince Zayed, former High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, uh, Dr. Comfort Iro, the current Vice President of uh, Crisis Group, and uh, now Helen Clark, formerly Head of UNDP and formerly uh, Prime Minister of, of, of New Zealand, helping us to think these things through because GDPR, other um, regulatory frameworks, 
um, as important as they are in taking steps forward, um, they, they're not su sufficiently specific to this kind of technical capacity. Right? There is so much that we could do within the bounds of the law, within the terms and conditions um, of, of others that could cause harm. Thanks, Chris. And you also have a lot of very thoughtful comments in the chat. I definitely recommend people to, to read through there through those because you went into great detail actually on some of the internal processes that you've set up at Peloria. Can I turn to Adriana next and ask really the same question? So, you know, maybe highlighting one of the, the risks that you that have been most significant for you and how you've tried to address that. Um, sure. I mean, you know, there's one project that the, the public ministry um, created a program called Amazonia Protege, which uses satellite to automatically map polygons of 60 hectares or more that have been deforested. And the resolution of these images is incredibly high. Um, but what happens is that even though the ministry is obliged to pr prosecute those carrying out the deforestation, they lack the personnel. So again, you have this glut of data and it creates more problems because there's, there's now a huge backlog. But I would say that the risk that concerns us the most really has to do with data privacy. Um, the fact that there is this massive data, data being generated, it's, it's incredibly high resolution. You can see a single tree and the system can detect whether a single tree has been felled uh, within the span of, of 24 hours. So um, if, you know, if that at some point is crossed with individual level data, it's very concerning because we're undergoing, of course, a process of you know, further dehumanization, especially of indigenous and Afro-descending populations. And 80% of the population in the Amazon belongs to those two groups within a context in which um, the federal government and the president himself has, have been working to criminalize civil society, especially civil society working on climate and environmental issues. Um, they're trying, for instance, to revive a law from the dictatorship years on terrorism in order to designate organizations such as ours uh, as terrorist organizations. And so um, you, you combine that with their efforts to silence the federal research institutions, such as the National Research Institution, which is what the, the one that manages the satellites and produces the data. And you create this very propitious environment for uh, misuse of the kind of data that's being uh, generated. So, I mean, obviously some of the solutions entail coming up with stronger norms and laws for protection of privacy at a local, but, but even at a collective level, especially with respect to uh, protected communities within the Amazon. Thanks very much, Andrea. Again, like a very, a very thoughtful approach. And I see more questions coming into the Q&A. This last one here on data colonialism, which actually was also asked, I think referenced previously. So I might ask um, Dan to address that in, in his remarks now, but really the same question about a, a key risk for you, how you've addressed it in a positive way. Um, and have you addressed this, the issue of data colonialism and um, the idea of sourcing from, from people who may not be participating in that sourcing um, explicitly. Certainly. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Dr. Arthur. Um, to to the, uh, the exact thing that was being asked here about, uh, is it not wrong to turn people into data subjects without their known consent as a commercial practice? Um, we, we are you know, sensitive to that. And so the first part of that known consent is um, basically we, we don't engage in, in that activity. Um, anyone contributing data to the system directly um, is, is doing that because they're working with us and is fully aware of uh, how the data is being gathered and how it's being used. Um, to the degree that any of our secondary data sources are um, you know, sweeping up information that, um, that might you know, be, um, uh, you know, contain additional information that somebody might not want out there, um, we, all, we monitor uh, the data sources for these. So, um, third-party data sources are usually free of these, but you know, open media data, just because it's out there on the internet, you know, is uh, you know is risky. So, um, where um, we have you know these these algorithms that you know look at it, and they're only they only want the things that speak directly to uh, the conflict in a way that is not specific um, to the civilians being affected by it. 
um, you know, that's what they're looking for. That's what we audit the algorithms for. Um, and you know, we're, we're sensitive to it. We haven't seen any case where that's popped up, but it's something we're worried about. And this is, you know, important, not just in the sense that, you know, this is, you know, the data colonialism is, is a real issue that we need to address. This also goes to physical security. Um, you know, the information like what I just described can be used to target people um, in a very dangerous places. Um, I would also um, point out that, um, you know, a to, to, the, to the second piece of this, which is the, the commercial venture side, the other the other bit that we're you know sensitive to is that you know we, we do not want to be war profiteers. Like we're you know we're we would love it if we could go out of business because peace broke out someplace, um, and this is genuine. But we realize that you know that can be seen as a conflict of interest, um, and so the, the you know the the key ways we approach this are one, we're trying to uh, we always approach with the principle of you know first we do no harm. And we're here first for the benefit of uh, the people that we're working with. And so that involves being open about how we're collecting the data, how the data is being used, making sure they have access to the data um, and so forth. Um, but it also for us means that, you know, we actually do spend um, a non-trivial amount of time working towards finding ways of supporting this, um, this mission uh, that isn't dependent on you know, Western donors and uh, and other people who just feel like giving us money to do a good thing, um, and this um, you know, in the one sense you know that you know is, means that I'm not spending absolutely every minute you know on this on this mission, but on the other hand, we think that this you know frees us up from you know that that initial uh, perceived conflict of interest that could arise. Thanks so much, Dan, and thanks especially for saying the words "do no harm." <laughs> You know, when we're looking at the intersection of peace building, um, data driven approaches, but also commercial enterprise, I think that kind of approach has to be at the center. Branka, were you coming in also to, to ask a question or make a comment? I was just to make a, a quick comment, take your page, just to follow up to what Dan said, and uh, because this really uh, came up as, a, as an important topic uh, and the discussion in the report is about, as well, the data colonialism uh, uh, issue. So just to add maybe on this, because um, uh, we quite often are late, what, what is the critique to the peace building field? We are quite late to keep up with the technologies, but I do think we have a lot of to contribute, as you said, to do no harm, like one of the principles principles that we contribute to the field. So uh, similar is with the, with the practices of data colonialism. Um, so there is a, a pushback, so to say, uh, of, of the movement that, that is uh, advocating for digital data to be decolonized in line with ethical and then human rights frameworks. So this is this intersection of human rights field uh, and the peace building field. And, and this topic is especially active with the indigenous communities uh, Adriana and I talked about this when we had an interview. This is really important topic in Latin America, across North America, Canada, uh, uh, um, uh, Australia, and so on. And, and this is where uh, we need to bring this discussion of data sovereignty and also self-determination of, of, the, of the data. So it's not about uh, not using the data at all. It's about using it in a pro proper way to give an ownership to certain communities and groups uh, uh, to, so they can claim their own rights uh, uh, through this data. So this is one of the avenues that appeared as a, as a so, sort of a solution or a step, uh, next step in, in developing the field. So this is just a quick comment and then maybe to give a, um, a, a an intro for a new possible discussion because I was picking comments uh, uh, and, and questions from the Q&A session and I see that the uh, issue of trust is coming in a lot of them, either directly or indirectly. So I think maybe this can be an interesting, just in a sentence or, or two, to hear from our uh, speakers, uh, how, how can they as a very active uh, uh, organizations in this field contribute to building uh, trust. And we often see maybe big tech companies not doing the best work in this field. So what can your organizations do to help uh, uh, building trust and utilizing big data uh, and data driven approaches to peace building? Great question, Branka. So, uh, so why don't we go, why don't we start with Dan this time around and switch up the order a bit and maybe do just a minute um, about the about trust uh, following Branka's question. 
Certainly. Um, so it's, you know, certainly trust is our, is, is something we, we face a, a great deal of, of emphasis on. Um, it is, I, I would be lying if, if I think I said that, you know, we have this figured out. Um, you know, it, it's definitely uh, dependent situationally. Um, and so, you know, you can go to, um, you know, different, different conflicts. And then, you know, you, um, if you can just talk to the wrong person, you know, then all of a sudden there is um, kind of a pall uh, cast on you and the efforts uh, that, that you're, um, that you're trying to do. Um, you know, so I think we, we try to be very careful about who we work with. Um, that especially is to extends um, to who we share data with. Um, and so we're, we're, very careful about who who our who our friends are, and you know, in reference to the previous question, um, you know, we're we're constantly working with the local partners um, because they understand all of this far better than we do, and they will you know kind of clue us in and you know help us be responsible with that data. Thanks, Dan. Chris. Um, naturally, we have the same issue uh, where. Um, I guess we take a different approach in the sense that we're always, I mean, objectivity is an impossibility, right? We're always going to have our own conscious or subconscious uh, biases about uh, um, what we think is the optimal um, uh, approach or who we think is making the, the best contribution uh, to a difficult context. And so rather than um, uh, being selective about who we engage with, where um, we constrain um, the potential uh, of, of what we deliver and what we don't deliver um, because we just don't have enough confidence in our own capacity to make those determinations. Um, I mean, share very much share the sentiment that Dan, that Dan just expressed, which is, um, you know, there's no, there's no template uh, for making determinations about who uh, sort of uh, to be crude, good guys who are bad guys. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's, that, that's a, an enormous uh, challenge, but we, we have this process for identifying uh, risk and then identifying the optimal methods for managing and mitigating that risk. But just to come back, quick, back really quickly to that point of the large uh, entities, if you're talking about social media entities, you know, some of this capacity where we're able to identify language configurations, uh, language phraseology, most associated with increase or decrease in violence, that may also be an objective metric that regulators can use in the future, right? To demand that there is some level of censorship, right? If the level of risk accompanying certain phraseology goes above 95%, 99%, right? There could be compelled uh, a warning to accompany that language if it is posted uh, on, on someone's platform. So uh, it's that kind of technical capacity that could make a, a contribution in the, in the future. Thanks very much, Chris. And I'd like to give the final word to Adriana on the issue of trust and building trust. Thank you, Paige. Well, right now in Brazil, we're operating in a context of extreme lack of trust, especially in institutions. I already mentioned the efforts to criminalize uh, civil society, especially working on issues of um, uh, disarmament and uh, climate and environment. There is widespread dissemination of fake news, especially within the context of the pandemic. And we just learned this past week that the government has canceled the next census. So the non-production of capillary uh, data uh, contributes towards this context of uh, lack of trust. And uh, we believe that the solution to this is, is not within the technology itself, but rather through the construction or the building back better of policies that are firmly grounded um, in people's perceptions and local communities' needs, and that work to protect people and the forest rather than destroy both of them. Adriana, I think that's actually the perfect way to end this session with that, with that thought. I want to thank all of you. I'd like to thank the Stockholm Forum, Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and of course our supporter, the, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Branka did just put into the chat, if this has sparked your interest in more, and I heard someone, or I saw someone in the Q&A say that a lot of this technology looks like rocket science. You know, how are we supposed to deal with it? We have a virtual week, a workshop coming up uh, May 18th through 21st, just on early warning, early action. 
where we will be having these kinds of sessions, but also technical capacity building sessions on, on how to use some of these new technologies. So please do click on that link and register. Thanks again to everybody for, for joining the, us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank everybody. You Thank you all. Thank you, Paige. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Branca. See you.